In today's wheelbarrow series class, we're going to talk about growing squash in Kentucky. We're going to talk about summer squash and winter squash. A little squash history. The word squash comes from the American set Native American word for ascuta squash, which simply means eaten raw or uncooked. Ancestral species of squash were in the Americas before the arrival of humans, which is over 30,000 years ago. The species of squash we're familiar with as food sources are native to the New World. Most of the gourd types are native to Africa. That would include the, the bottle gourd, the dipper gourd, the bushel basket gourds, and, and those really hard shell gourds. Squash likely originated in the Southwest United States, Mexico, Mesoamerica, and South America. The earliest proven evidence of domestication of squash dates back at least 8,000 years. Our archaeological digs from the Ecuadorian cave suggest that it could have been back as far as 12,000 years. Squash was the first of the three sisters to be domesticated, predating maize and beans by some 4,000 years. In the picture here, you can see uh, the hill of the three sisters, and you can see corn in the middle of the hill, and they're also uh, planted with uh, pole beans, which would have been grown for dried beans. Then the corn would have been grown for uh, dried corn, too, to make meal and things out of. And then we have the pumpkin or the squash. There is the vining plant around uh, the, the hill there. The uh, pumpkins can take a little bit of shade, but they most likely planted these in hills and gave enough room uh, around the hills where the pumpkins could grow. In this method, the corn was uh, the uh, kind of considered the pole for the beans, and then uh, the pumpkin uh, grew around with the spiny plants and kept some of the varmints out of it. And then uh, the beans provided the nitrogen for everything because they fixed their own nitrogen. Native Americans use squash as a food staple with different types being grown to eat at different times of the year. And they also included eating their seeds. Squash were grown by Native Americans from southern parts of Canada down to Argentina and Chile. That was by the time that the European settlers uh, had found uh, the New World. Most likely, it, uh, the cucurbit species started in those areas we talked about earlier, the southwest U.S., Mexico. And then uh, as Native Americans traveled, uh, further, they took the seeds and, and different tribes planted, and that's how we ended up with different uh, varieties. There are roughly 27 species of cucurbits identified in the Americas, with five that have been domesticated. Also, most of these can cross with each other, so it's, it's hard to pin some of these down without a genetic test. Uh, but there is so much variation out there because these have been grown here so long and they can mix uh, readily. One of the domesticated squash species is the cucumber de maxima. This has a round, thick stem, as you can see there, where it was cut from the plant. Uh, these include the buttercup, the hubbard, the turban, and, the, and some of the winter pumpkins. They're usually large fruit with very hard, with hard seeds, uh, and they ripen in the fall. So this would be a winter squash, winter store, and these would have to be peeled or uh, scraped from the flesh because the peeling is just too hard for us to eat. Another one is cucumber de muscata. Uh, these have round stems, and this is the winter squash or the butternut squash, uh, as we mostly know them by, but there's numerous varieties of these out there as well. Then we have Cucumber de Pepo, which has the pentagonal or prickly stems. These are the ones that uh, usually cause us to maybe itch or break out whenever we're picking. This includes zucchini, which is actually Italian for sweetest, uh, the maro, uh, the courgette, which is a French one, the yellow squash, ornamental gourds uh, that we uh, put out in the fall are also one of the pepos. And then we have the crookneck squash, the spaghetti squash, which doesn't really have a soft rind on it, but it is in this group as well, but it does store kind of like a winter squash does in the summer pumpkins. Usually these are soft edible shelled and, uh, and the seeds are small. We, we eat these when the uh, fruit is small, so we eat the seeds too. Uh, they ripen in summer and they need to be eaten soon after harvest because they don't store well, except maybe for the spaghetti squash and those ornamental gourds. Then we have cucumber agarisperma, which is uh, the, uh, another winter squash, uh, such as the silver seeded gourd or the green striped kusha. So kusha is what most of us uh, know this one by. Then we have the one that you probably won't see around here much. Um, it's much less of a food uh, than the other other groups are, but this is Cucumber de Ficofolia, and it's because of the uh, fig life like a leaf on it. Um, this is also called the black seeded squash or black uh, leaf or fig leaf gourd, 
Uh, and you can see that picture down there has very large stem, uh, uh, black seeds in it and not a lot of flesh. So that's why it never did catch on as much as the other uh, species did as far as uh, Europeans go. After the Europeans uh, settled into North America, they took uh, their food sources back. Uh, squash is listed as one of the seven New World foods that changed Europe forever, along with potato, sunflower, corn, cacao, which is chocolate, uh, tomato, and bananas. The first images of squash in the Old World were in Touraine, France, dated between 1503 and 1508. And then the first identified record of squash being a food source in the Old World was in 1591. Uh, this squash here is the terrain squash, which is uh, one of the ones that was grown a lot in terrain uh, France and ended up being actually a, a kind of its own cultivar there because I guess they crossed a few or they did naturally. But this one doesn't look large in the picture, but it's actually a quite large fruit and it was grown more for the large seeds inside of the, uh, the uh, fruit and they toasted it and, and, and ate the seeds and then the flesh is actually more for animal fodder. Squash does have to have full sun. That's usually greater to or equal than six hours uh, of full sun to grow uh, to its optimum ability. Um, later, we're gonna talk about soil, access to the garden, air drainage, and proximity uh, to trees and shrubs. First off is our soil. Squash need well-drained uh, soil because they don't like to have wet feet. You're just gonna cause some root rot problems. Um, if you have heavy clay soil, there are some things you can do. You can add organic matter, obviously, and you can also even raise, uh, uh, make a raised bed and put uh, soil that's better in that raised bed. Uh, you need to work your soils down to six to seven inches, optimally, for these to grow well. And then you need to remove some large stones or clods or plant debris if you've got a lot of that. Uh, that's particularly important with root crops if you're growing other types of vegetables in this garden as well. First off, as always, um, you're going to hear me say this uh, for every crop we grow, you need to get a soil test. If you've gotten a soil test done in the last three years, it's still good. Um, so you keep that in mind. If you did one last year, you can always pull it. Uh, if, you, in, in, if you did one in Washington County, you're going to have a handwritten uh, recommendation from me on there, and that still should be good. Uh, you want to sample six to seven inches deep in five areas of the garden randomly. And then we're going to check for pH, and we want the pH to be between 6.0 and 6.8. Uh, optimum is 6.4 for most of our vegetable crops. And we're going to check for phosphorus and potassium. Uh, we can't check for nitrogen because remember that nitrogen comes and goes in the air and into the soil. So we're going to have to put a nitrogen source down no matter what. And then also organic matter. Sometimes we can do organic matter tests, but most of the time we're going to go ahead and tell you to apply some organic matter because it's really good for your soil. Uh, if you didn't get a soil test and you're not going to do one, then our uh, regular recommendation would be to apply 10 10 10 at 25 pounds per thousand square feet that would be um, only 12 and a half pounds of triple 19 per 1000 square feet as far as organic matter add compost it's going to be a, one of the better things you can do for your garden if you've got it add it uh, it will improve your water retention it will promote soil structure which makes it looser and easier to work and easier to work in it will increase your fertility because you're adding all that organic matter with all those nutrients in it. It would also increase your cation exchange capacity, which basically is your soil's ability to hold nutrients and to make them available to plants. So with the more uh, cation exchange capacity, the better off uh, your uh, soil is going to be and the better off your plants are going to be because those nutrients are there and going to be easier for them to grab a hold of. Uh, it also will reduce your fertilizer requirements by up to 50%. Yes, you heard that correct. So it's going to save you money if you've got compost. Uh, also, it will enhance microbial activity, which is really good for having healthy soils. That will suppress the bad guys. So if you've got some, you've had some uh, root rots or some other problems in that garden or even funguses uh, and things that were attacking your plants, if you add these good stuff to your soil, any of that that would overwinter, if you turned it under, the good guys would go ahead and take care of those for you. It also will accelerate, accelerate the breakdown of pesticides and other maybe synthetic compounds that might have gotten into your soil. Next is access. You want to make sure this is near the house, which as you should all your vegetable and fruit crops, if at all possible, that's just going to make it easier to get to for harvesting. That's the biggest thing is harvesting because 
these summer squashes grow so quickly and come on so fast that you need to be out there just about every day. You also want access for weeding and cultivating and uh, also close to the house generally means close to a water source so you can water these as well. It also will help you uh, deter some of the things that may want to eat your squash. I know squash is probably not that uh, big of a uh, uh, thing that raccoons and other things might want to eat. But if you're planting winter squash, it starts to get uh, down later in the fall. Deer and things can uh, come in there. If they learn that there's something really nice there, they can actually stomp those uh, uh, fruit and start eating on those. Air drainage is another thing. It's not as big a problem with some of our later crops like this. Uh, but just wanted to throw it out there to let you know that low-lying areas are subject to unseasonable frost and waterlogged soils. Waterlogged soils are probably a bigger issue uh, because we're going to plant these after uh, the last frost. South-facing slopes do warm more quickly, so if you wanted to try something earlier, maybe have some frost cover there handy, you could uh, do those south-facing slopes. Also, protected sites with reasonably good airflow is best uh, because that airflow is going to help dry that foliage uh, faster, and it's going to help control some of the diseases that we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, and also, uh, it can shield from damaging thunderstorms and winds if you're on the right slope compared to where your prevailing winds come from. Another thing is uh, you want to make sure that you don't plant too close to trees and shrubs because they're just, they're just too much competition. Uh, you can get unwanted shade if they're trees or large shrubs. Also, they're going to compete for water and nutrients, which is not good because we're adding nutrients and we're trying to water these plants to get good production. Another one is uh, what's in the picture here is walnut. You don't want to plant close to a walnut uh, because it has uh, a chemical in it called juglone, uh, which it emits from its roots. It's in the holes of the walnuts and the leaves and all parts of the plant. And it's actually a growth uh, inhibitor and it can actually kill plants uh, that grow close to that. Uh, one that it would kill outright would probably be tomatoes. Uh, other things that it would stunt would be your corn, your squash, and all those other vegetable crops as well. You want to at least put the garden at least 10 feet from any tree or shrub. Depending on how large they are, you may need to be further away from that. When I say 10 feet, I'm saying 10 feet from the drip line. So the trunk may be 30 feet away. So just keep those in mind. You don't want to get too close to some of these uh, trees and shrubs. Another thing to think about is weed control. Uh, weeds can compete with plants for the sunlight, water, nutrients, and space, and pretty much just push them out of the picture if you're not careful. You want to reduce perennial weeds before planting. You can do that by solarizing with clear plastic. Clear is better than black because clear allows uh, the sunlight in and heats it up quicker. Kind of think of your car when it's sitting with the door shut and the wind and the uh, sun is out and it gets hot really quickly. Same works with the plastic. Herbicides can also be used. You can uh, go ahead and spray Roundup on any of those perennial weeds now, and in a couple weeks, you can till those under. Uh, after planting, you can use preen to inhibit uh, new weed seeds from germinating, but you need to wait until after you've uh, got your plants up and actively growing before you put preen down. Tillage is the other option that most of us use for taking care of any of those weeds. You're going to have to hoe regularly to keep annual weeds under control, or as I said, put preen down after your new little seedlings are up and actively growing. You can work that soil up and then you can add preen and that'll stop most of the small weed uh, seeds from germinating. Uh, once actively growing, vining crops though actually compete well with weeds. So once you've got those taken care of, by the time you get a uh, vine out by a couple feet, uh, these vining crop uh, uh, types actually take uh, over the weeds pretty quickly. There's going to be weeds there, they're just going to climb over them. As far as watering, for optimum growth, vegetables of all types need about one inch of water per week. However, there are some exceptions where they may need a little more than that. In, as far as temperature, squash is a warm season crop. They develop best at temperatures above 50. So uh, if you know it's going to be below 50, don't plant yet. That's why we want to wait and plant these after uh, the signs of frost are passed. Usually for us, that's around Derby Day here in Kentucky, which is the first Saturday in May. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're not from around here, uh, they can squash will be killed by frost. So you've got to plant to avoid that. As far as um, the average frost dates around here, uh, this is a warm season crop. So again, we have to avoid frost. So in central Kentucky, as you can see there, our average last frost is between April 30th and May 5th. Uh, this data is a little bit old. It may have backed up a little bit since then. 
But again, that puts you right in there with planning around that first week of May, which gives us about 150 to 160 degree uh, or 150 to 160 uh, days of frost free growing. Um, and then if you're for other parts of the state, if you're more west, it's a little longer, more east, it's a little shorter. Vining squash should only be grown if you have adequate space and depending on the varieties that, that you plant, some of those can grow up to 20 feet uh, in one direction from the center of the hill. So you need to keep that in mind that make sure you've got plenty of space for those. Uh, vining squash can also be grown under corn um, as they're one of the few vegetables that will grow in a little bit of partial shade. And I say a little bit, this is not a complete corn field like you're thinking of corn. It's more planting in hills with the corn in the middle of the hill. Uh, think of the three sisters. Also, you want to make sure you, you uh, think about crop rotation with these as far as uh, diseases go, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Again, you want to plant uh, your squash after danger of frost has passed. Uh, if you want pumpkins for Halloween, though, and I know I've said pumpkins and squash, pumpkins are actually a squash. Squash is not necessarily a pumpkin. <laughs> it, just keep remembering that pumpkin is a squash. Uh, but again, if you want the, the pumpkin for Halloween, you need to count uh, based on maturity days. Otherwise, they would rot before we got to Halloween. So you'll think when well, Halloween is October 31st, and if you've got an 80-day pumpkin, then you need, need to count uh, back 80 days, and that's when you would plant, or thereabouts, maybe 100 days. Uh, if planting vining squash, uh, space your hills about 8 to 12 feet apart in all directions. Again, to allow for uh, vining and airflow. Um, you may also plant in rows 12 feet apart with six to eight feet within the rows. So you don't have to plant in hills. You can plant in rows. You even plant hills in rows. It's up to you how you do that. Bush types of squash should be planted three feet apart in rows uh, and uh, rows four feet apart. So within the row, they're going to be three feet. Uh, between the row, they're going to be four feet. That's just going to give you plenty of space to get in there and pick. Uh, and don't do like I do and plant them too close and have to be down on your hands and knees trying to get in there to find your squash and zucchini because you're going to miss some. Uh, and when you do find them, they're going to be so big, you're going to have to throw them away. Squash need a lot of water. Uh, that's why a while ago when I said one inch, I said, uh, however, uh, especially once they have a have set fruit, especially if you're on some of the larger squash or pumpkins, uh, drought will reduce fruit size drastically on those. So generally, they're going to need one to two inches per week. Uh, especially when sizing up. Summer squash though, one inch is plenty for them uh, per week. You want to side dress when your plants begin to vine with one pound of urea per thousand square feet. Uh, that's going to help to size up your fruit size uh, a little bit on these. And you don't really need to do that on anything but the vining types. The, the bush types will be just fine with the initial uh, fertilizer that you put down. Weeds can be an issue if you're not careful, so we have to take precautions to keep those out. Uh, to keep them under control. Um, you can use herbicides such as preen. Again, after your plants are up and actively growing, you put that down. Um, and then you can either use mulch, uh, either organic or plastic. If you use plastic, make sure you have a water source under it. Uh, if you use that landscape fabric you see in the top picture, uh, water will go through that, so you're, you're okay there. Um, and then organic there at the bottom is straw. You can use whatever you want. Uh, someone this morning asked if they put cardboard and then straw on top of it or a newspaper and then straw on top of it, that's actually ideal because if you just put paper or, or cardboard down when it dries out and we come one of those heavy thunderstorms in the summer, it'll shed water and not let it soak in the ground. So if you put an organic mulch over that, that's going to uh, help that quite a, a bit to keep that moist and help it break down and let uh, the water into the soil. Some of the problems you may encounter, uh, one that's going to be hit or miss, uh, you may be one or two a year, some years they can be bad. Uh, but it's a squash vine borer. Here the vines or plants will wilt an entire, uh, and the entire plant will die. Uh, by the time it's noticed, usually it's too late when you start to see it uh, wilting. See the sawdust-like frass from the base of the plant there in the picture? You can see that around where those borers are. Uh, those borers there are just the grubs, uh, the wasp there at the top, which looks like a wasp, uh, but it's actually a, a borer. But those grubs are quite long. Some of those are an inch, inch and a half long. Uh, and you can see how they burrow the entire stem. This is another picture of a stem that has borers in it. And again, you can see it looks like they're, it's, it's kind of rotten. You can see the little frass uh, or sawdust-like uh, material there. Um, once you see that, you know that plant's a goner. Um, 
what you need to do is take that plant and destroy it. When I say destroy it, you need to make sure that entire stem is crushed or those uh, larvae are crushed, crushed in there. I have split one of those stems before and had six of those large bores in there. So usually if I have a plant that way, I'm going to take a knife and split that stem and make sure uh, I kill all those bores that's in that one. Because if you let five or six go, that's another five or six wasps out there that, that are reproducing and laying more eggs. Um, you do need to uh, make sure that you monitor those vines. When you first see one, maybe getting a little symptom like that, usually it's going to be in late June through August whenever they hit. And usually it's right at the, the beginning of production for summer squash is whenever you really start to notice those starting to come in. You want to target your sprays at the stems. There's no reason to spray the flowers really, or not the flowers, but the leaves really. Uh, the goal is to get that stem because that's where they're going to lay their eggs. Um, the insecticides you're going to need for homeowners is usually a seven or a malathion. Make sure you don't spray whenever the leaf or the flowers are open because we don't want to uh, bother any of our pollinators. So you're going to either do it really early in the morning or really late in the evening uh, to avoid those pollinators. Squash bugs is another one that's really bad. These usually show up in late July and early August. Uh, they are hard to control once the populations are allowed to get uh, large. So you want to make sure you go in there and you get those under control as soon as they hit. Um, they do suck sap, so that's another reason it's a little harder to kill than some of these because when they eat leaves, they get a larger dose than if they just poke holes in leaves like these do. Um, you can see there at the top, that's the larval stage, the little gray with black legs. And then you can see the adult there. It's more flattened, uh, has more covering or armor on its back. And then down to below that, you can see the egg mass, which are a copper color, and they're really hard, so you can't really just mash those. You usually just take that little piece of leaf and pull it off and then get it out of the garden and either uh, crush it with your foot on, on concrete or with a rock or something, because they're really hard. You can't, you can't squeeze those just with your fingers and squish those. This is a picture, if you see there, whenever these have gotten out of hand, they've already killed most of the plants, and then this is a pumpkin that's left and you can see how they're just all over that pumpkin. Uh, to help get rid of these, you need to use crop rotation, which means rotating out of cucurbits in that area. Another is make sure you clean your beds off good and get some of that, all that material out of there because the eggs can overwinter. Uh, mainly destroying your egg masses early will keep the populations down. As soon as you see those copper egg masses, uh, pull those out and destroy those. And then insecticides, you need to time accordingly. As soon as you see any of these little tiny nymphs, and they are quite small when they first start, and they're going to be at the base of the plant, make sure you get in there with an insecticide and get rid of those because you don't want that population to build up to the point that there's no way you can control them. Uh, some of the sprays that you can use um, are 7, malathion, and pyrethrins. The 7 and the malathion will stick around a little long. The pyrethrins more of a knockdown. So if you've got a big uh, mass of these uh, on one spot like this, pyrethrins work quite well because they kill on contact but the residual doesn't stay there, so it's not gonna kill it once coming behind it. Cucumber beetles, another one. Uh, these can feed on pollen, uh, flowers, and late season feeding actually can damage fruit appearance. They also vector bacterial wilt, which is much more important, especially on cucumbers. Um, you do wanna monitor for these beetles. Uh, they have a large hatch for two to three weeks, and if you can get that large hatch uh, in summer, you can really knock their populations down. And you can see there are two forms. There's a spotted on the left, and then there's a striped on the right. Uh, the cucumber beetles, if you don't get them under control early and let them go uh, haywire, they can cause you some fruit problems. Uh, generally, they don't cause that much problem, more of a vectoring of disease uh, than actually causing uh, problems on the plants. Uh, but you can see this pumpkin here. Um, that's the pumpkin itself, all the green scraped off, and that's because we had a lot of cucumber beetles and they all foraged on that pumpkin late in the season. And, you know, they've really just kind of destroyed the outside of it. Um, so again, generally, if you can get them controlled early, you're fine. Uh, you're going to treat with seven pyrethrins or malathion again uh, to get those populations down. Again, don't spray when your flowers are, are open or when the pollinators are actively, actively out uh, pollinating. One of the bigger diseases that you're going to find is powdery mildew. There in the picture, you can see the powdery mildew on the top of the leaf. Uh, leaves are covered with this powdery mold, um, and eventually it will kill the leaves and the plant. Um, this one doesn't have to have water necessarily to be active. It just likes a moist condition. Uh, so it usually develops sometime in August or even late July when we start having fogs because it likes that, uh, that higher humidity. Um, 
if you want, you can look for resistant varieties for these. Also, give an adequate room where the leaves can kind of get more air circulation to keep uh, the moisture down can help. Uh, and once the symptoms are first noticed, you need to start a biweekly spray program of Mancozea bradaconeal. Um, the active ingredient in dicanil is chlorothalonil. Uh, it's also so by Brennan's fungonil. There's a lot of them, but chlorothalonil is the active ingredient that you need to look for on the label. Here we have gummy stem blight. Uh, the stems develop a dry rot in moist or wet conditions. I don't see this one a lot, but it is possible to have an outbreak uh, and a large outbreak in the field. Uh, the disease actually overwinters on plant residue and saved seeds. So um, if you're not a seed saver, you've avoided that one. Um, and as far as uh, plant residue, you make sure you need to clean your garden. Up. That's a big key to getting some of this uh, uh, problems out of your garden. Uh, you can also control by using a three to four year rotation. Uh, so in the area that you've had this disease, don't put, put cucurbits back there for three or four years. You can spray the plants with dicanil or mancozeb again. Again, chlorothalonil is the active ingredient dicanil. And you do that on a seven day rotation while your condition, get, conditions persist for development. And usually, uh, you know, it, it just depends on um, how wet it is and if that uh, bacteria is actually there. Yeah, you can also plant disease resistant varieties if you know you've had uh, a pretty bad outbreak. But around here, it's usually not that bad unless you're growing for more for a commercial uh, uh, case than it is just for a backyard gardener. Then we have downy mildew, which is another one of those we don't have every year, but when we do have it, it can be quite devastating. It produces circular yellow spots on the surface of the leaves, on the undersurface of the leaves with mold developing, as you can see in the pictures here. Uh, the disease generally develops at the crown and works its way outward, and it's also encouraged by wet, humid weather. So this is one that actually loves having uh, rain and, and free water to help move it around. Uh, it can kill the plants quickly, so once you see this, uh, these little circular spots on the leaf, make sure you get in there and get your uh, fungicide sprays on. Uh, and you can control with targeted sprays of dicanil, which is chlorothalonil again, and mechazam. But this one, you need to make sure you get on the un undersides of the leaves as well, so you can kill those spores on the undersides of the leaves. When harvesting your squashes, you want to harvest the first summer squash seven to eight weeks after seeding, so about two months. Uh, and the fruit should be two to three inches in diameter and, and usually no more than seven inches long. Uh, you also need to make sure you handle summer squash gently as it bruises and scratches pretty easily. And then you can refrigerate them up for up to one week. I usually like to put those in a plastic grocery bag, just fold it lightly and put it in a crisper. It'll keep, they'll keep easily a week that way. Winter squash and pumpkins are harvested at three to four months after planting, depending on the varieties. And harvest winter squash and pumpkins before a hard frost. A light frost won't hurt them necessarily, but a hard frost or hard freeze definitely will. Uh, the outer skin of the winter squash and pumpkins should also resist your fingernail when, when put pressure on. So the shell should be pretty hard. Uh, if you uh, pick these too early, they will rot. So you want to make sure that that outside uh, uh, shell on those actually hardens. You want to cure your winter squash and pumpkins by exposing them to 80 degree temperatures for 7 to 10 days. For most of us, at that time of year, we're picking those. Our highs usually are 75 to 85, so we kind of get that naturally. And then after that, you can store them at 40 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit for long-term storage. If you could get them that, if you have a basement, something that's fine. That can be it for up to two to three months. I have stored uh, some of the winter squashes at room temperature for six, seven months. So a lot of these can actually keep a lot longer uh, than uh, we actually have been taught that they will, or maybe people just uh, did, didn't keep them that long because they ate them. I just threw these pictures out there to show you some of the variety that's out there. This is actually a bunch of summer squashes. Uh, and you can see that some of these don't look like what we think of summer squash, but they actually are summer squash eaten like we would our zucchinis or our yellow crooknecks and those kinds of things. Uh, and here we have some variety of winter squash. And you can see some of these are quite warty and knotty on the outside, which is fun. Uh, that's just uh, the way they grow. Um, they're, they're fine. Um, you know, they look uh, more like a gourd that one in the middle does, but um, the flesh inside is what we're after, not that tough rind on the outside. And then here's a few more uh, of the winter squash varieties. That one on the, on the bottom right, um, there's one called pink banana that's similar to that one, and there's a lot of other ones out there. Uh, that type is one I have stored from uh, late September all the way to June at room temperature and ate it, and it was still just as fresh as it was whenever it was harvested.
for those that uh, attended the class or have registered and paid for the class, you're going to get a few seeds of each one of these. Uh, this is a delicata squash here called Jester. Uh, if you've not had these, these are quite uh, good. Uh, right from harvest to cooking, they're sweet. Kind of tastes a little bit like a sweet potato. And these have shorter vines, but they are vining type. Then we have uh, Hubbard Blue Ballet. This is a more of a, a little smaller Hubbard than than the old fashioned Hubbard. Um, they're calling it a sweet scaled, scaled down Hubbard, which is good. It also doesn't have as many fibers inside, so it makes it the flesh a lot better to eat. Um, it is also easier to cut than other types uh, as the skin is more tender than some of the older varieties. Here we have Black Butsu Butternut. Uh, this one is like a butternut, but that we're used to the butternut shape. This has a different shape. This is actually a beloved Japanese delicacy. Uh, so this one is really nice. The thing about this one is, though, it does have very long vines to so give it plenty of room to grow. Um, and it does have that little cloudy bloom on the outside, which looks like uh, maybe like a little bit of uh, blush on it that wipes off. But that's natural. That's the way it grows. Uh, this one is, is a good one for long-term storage. Then we have kombucha squash uh, sunshine. Uh, sunshine. Uh, this is a variety of, of kombucha squash, which is a little bit smaller. It has deep scarlet uh, outside, which makes it very pretty. Uh, it also has smooth, tender flesh that is sweet and bright orange. It's good for mashing, uh, baking, making pies, those kinds of things. Uh, it does have a vigorous vine, but it is a short vine, which has been bred to be a little shorter. Uh, so that's going to help if you don't have quite as much garden room. Then we have the uh, spaghetti squash. This is an open pollinated strain, so you can save seeds of this one. Uh, spaghetti squash is just that. You bake it, and then you take a fork, and you scrape the insides out, and it comes out looking like little pieces of noodles. Uh, that's really good. You can bake or boil it to get that. Um, it's really good with spaghetti uh, uh, sauce on it or anything like that. It's really even good with just salt and pepper and butter on it, for that matter. This one is uh, an acorn squash tip top. This is a better tasting, uh, larger acorn than what most of us are used, used to. Um, it is a little more flavorful. It also holds its black green color, which is kind of really pretty there in the picture. Um, it is a vigorous, larger semi-bush plant. So uh, a lot of the acorns are vining plants. This one's semi-bush. It doesn't take quite as much room. Uh, it also has a little resistance to powdery mildew, which is good for a later season crop. Then we have patty pan squash lemon sun. This is another new one that was bred to be smaller and more uniform. Um, the little blemish uh, free fruits are great. I just like this one because I thought, <laughs> thought it was cute and the color was great. Um, and you can actually cook these whole and eat them whole if you'd like. If you've not had patty pan, it pretty much tastes the same as uh, the yellow summer squash that we're used to. I should say it is a summer squash. Uh, then we have our regular yellow uh, squash. This is Tempest. If you look at the picture there, you can see it actually does have a lighter and a darker yellow stripe on it uh, that grows about four to seven inch fruits are, are really nice and nutty flavor good to eat uh, it's good for grilling and roasting and pickling and raising which is most of our yellow squash then we have uh, a zucchini pantheon uh, if you haven't had uh, some of the the older roman types or romanesco types of uh, zucchini they're kind of fun to grow uh, you can see the shape there when you cut them if you slice them to fry they actually make little star shapes. They're really cute whenever they're fried that way. This one also has the edible blossom, which most of these are edible, but this one's grown quite a bit for the blossoms themselves. If you like to fry those, uh, batter those and deep fry those, they do that a lot over in uh, Italy. This is one of those that's really good for that as well. And then we have the old, uh, I want to say the old fashioned, but the regular zucchini. This one's spineless perfection, which is good because it doesn't have quite as much spines, which will help uh, cut down on some of that uh, arm itching whenever you harvest these. Uh, this one has multiple disease resistance, which is also good. Uh, and it does bear for a long period of time, as long as you can keep those squash vine borers and squash bugs out of there. It also has resistant to powdery mildew, uh, some mosaic viruses, and the Zugini yellow mosaic virus. And last but not least, we have the Golden Glory uh, Zucchini. If you've never eaten a yellow zucchini, uh, they have a really good flavor. They're nice. Uh, and they don't have, they have more of the texture of uh, the green zucchini, which is a little more firm than the squash, but they have a little buttery flavor, kind of similar to the yellow squash. Uh, this one is also spineless, which is going to help cut down on your uh, prickles whenever you're uh, picking it. Um, also has a little resistant to powdery mildew, watermelon, 
what the water melon, easy for me to say, mosaic virus and the zucchini yellow mosaic virus. Well, there we have it. Uh, if anybody has any questions on growing uh, squash in Kentucky, they can call me at the Washington County, Kentucky Extension Office at 859-336-7741. Happy gardening.